Well, welcome to the 20, July 21 meeting IHSA Queensland. It's our second meeting here using this new venue with generally, generously invite, provided for us by Archfield Aircraft Airport Corporation by Rod Perry, the general manager. Tonight, as well as having members here, we're Zooming, our IHSA colleagues in the country or interstate can join us easily then. A couple of housekeeping items that you've all signed in. Janice Anderson's bought some books, which are available there to, if you'd like to have some. And we have a guest, Mal Herman, the guest of Janice Anderson here. And uh, our guest speaker tonight will be, Mary will be introducing us shortly. Um, a local thing for people here in Brisbane, in a fortnight on Sunday, Sunday 15th of August, between 11 and 3 p.m., the Kabuka Aero Club is holding a low-key open day for the public with the aim of highlighting historic aircraft owned by Kabuka Aero Club members and showcasing Kabuka's mu unique museum's TAVAS, Australian Vintage Aircraft Society, and the Kabuka Warplane Work Museum, and many other vintage and veteran aircraft which call Australia home, uh, call Kabuka home. It won't be an air show or a flying display, but the plan will be having as many as possible historic aircraft around the Caboolture Aero Club's clubhouse as possible. AHSA Queensland will be having a small display there. Several members have volunteered to look after our display. And if we have a couple more, that'll be all the better. And anyone else, uh, please put your hand up and I'll speak to you before we go. Next month, our guest speaker will be Air Commodore John Meyer for an update on aircraft, Air Force history and heritage in this our country, Air Force's centenary year. Future months we've got planned to have in September, Kim Rolf Smith, we talk about operating and flying warbirds, and Garrett Russell, history of gliding, and Ross Parker on waterways in the future months. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest speaker, Mary Garden, who's talking tonight is about her father, the forgotten aviator. Mary? Thank you all for coming here today, and um, especially Don and Peter for organising this. Um, I came down here in October 2005. Were any of you here then? Not here. 2005. It was the 75th anniversary of my father's flight. And it was organised by Roger Marks. Is he on the Sunshine Coast? Is he on the Sunshine Coast now? So I can't remember what I talked about then because it was right at the beginning of my journey. I probably just winged it and had a few photos. And that was um, six months after I had written my very first article on my father. And I was just a um, novice journalist and I managed to get the centre spread in the Australian Financial Review at Easter. Sundown of the Skies, there's the original paper. And at that time, I thought that would be all I could write on my father. He was dead and he'd kept no diaries. Very little had been written about him. If you went on Google, there was one entry and that had been written by my half-sister who was a librarian at Alexander Turnbull Library. And there were a few chapters in books. I think two chapters, there was one by Morris McGreal and another one by Ian someone. And, you know, as I came to find, it was only a chapter, so much in these books and magazines and newspaper articles were wrong. Either my father hadn't told the truth or he had forgotten and even going back to the original newspaper. So at the beginning, I thought that's all I can do. And there was so much interest in this article. And one person who contacted me was Richard Hitchens. Yes. And honestly, I'm really sad that he wasn't around to see my book because literally thousands, um, no, I'll go back to this article. It was actually writing this article and I decided just to focus on his 1930 flight. And I was quite ambivalent at that time. I was quite ambivalent. I didn't really realize the, the significance of what he had done. My mother and her sisters used to downplay it and say, dad just is big noting himself. And you know, what's so significant about being the fourth aviator to fly solo from England to Australia. 
But when I dug into it, I thought, oh my God, you know, he only had 40 hours flying experience. Um, he had no financial backing and support. He was the youngest and he was the very first person to fly over the Great Sandy Desert from Wyndham over to Alice Springs, which Dick Smith said was a huge achievement. I mean, I think that the year before those two aviators had crashed and died when they went out to look for Kingsford Smith. And, you know, he had the secondhand aeroplane. And I thought that's when I realised, you know, how significant the other, the other thing also is that all the other aviators had died in crashes, or most of them, except Gene Batten. And um, there was all this pressure and encouragement, especially from Richard, urging me to write a book, which I thought that's just impossible. But I pretended I was going to write one, and I kept, you know, I wrote a few more articles. And um, hundreds of emails between Richard Hitchens. Here is one email. Dear Mary, fantastic, he's, he's spelt it P-H, fantastic. Keep going on with your book, the story of your initial motivation, the lack of knowledge of your father's exploits, that de your determination to commemorate his achievements is now being developed into a detective story. Newspaper clippings or newspaper archives, plus excerpts from published books, will help to round out the image of your father and the atmosphere of the day. So I did um, work on this for a few years. Thankfully, my mother was still alive so I could interview her and she wanted it to be warts and all. And um, there were a few, I went over and interviewed some of the Teal pilots who dad trained. So I was very lucky that I did start this in 2005 and I was able to go over to New Zealand, go to Stewart Island, meet some of those people who were on the beach when he did the first aerial landing on Stewart Island. But then after a few years, I gave up. I just thought, I'm not a historian. This is too hard. It's too boring. Then my mother got sick and my sister got sick and I was flying backwards and forwards to New Zealand. And I thought of, sort of put it to a side and went back to university to do an editing course and somehow ended up with a PhD in journalism, which mostly was quite useless, except <laughs> It did teach me how to do end notes. And when I'd finished that $80,000 thesis, I thought, ah, oh, this book was just there all the time haunting me. It was like the story was meant to be written. And I thought, if I can write an 80,000 word thesis, I'm damn well going to finish this book on my father. And I got the missing link, what I needed to do, because I thought I don't want just to write a dry aviation biography. I want it to appeal to a wide range of readers. So I put my story through it. And I think that changed everything because a lot of aviation people, you know, have loved my book, even though it is warts and all. And I, you know, I don't, I, I don't, my father did have a very cruel streak and we had quite um, an unhappy childhood. And um, in spite of all of that, People, you know, have said, you know, you've done your father proud with this story. So what I'll do today is just give a quick overview of my father's life. So I think in 2019, my book was at last published. And um, I thought it had finished its life. And then there was a renewed interest when it was shortlisted for the New South Wales Premier's History Award last year. Ironically, because there was... Um, th articles written about this in New Zealand, there was renewed interest in my book. And my book sold out really quickly. But I think because of COVID, my publisher was quite reluctant to do a reprint. But then after the shortlisting for the History Award, and this extra interest after my sister's book, I managed to persuade them to do a new edition. And um, so this is the new edition, which came out a few weeks ago. It's got 77 extra pages, and I put logbook extracts in there which is something my sister did. And I thought, that's fantastic. That was the best thing about her book. And it is really, it's great because it just brings it alive. You've got dad's writing in there. And then I also noticed, oh my God, I've got a mistake there. I've got that date wrong. So the log books don't lie. So it's been quite a journey. And I'm actually going out to Alice Springs next week to do the official launch of this book. And I've been meaning to go out there for years because... Um, 
My father was the, the first pilot to fly from Wyndham to Alice Springs and it was a huge thing. I'll just briefly give you a summary of my father's life. Um, he was born right up here. It's still very dark, isn't it? Up in Tongue. He was born up in Tongue, which is a very small, isolated village in the far north of Scotland, 500 people. I think, I think there's still 500 people there today, a very bleak and isolated part of um, Scotland. His father... And over these next few years, he lived in Tongue. His father was born in Orkney. The gardens all came for centuries from rain. Um, when the family broke up, the grandmother came down to South End of Sea, like 2009, I think. And then he also spent time in, where's Manchester? Not there. Manchester? Yeah. So he moved around a lot. So both my father, um, his father and his grandfather were pioneers. I haven't got time to go into this story, but it is really quite incredible. That's my father's grandfather, Robert Garden. And um, that's a real uh, rag to riches tale. He was born into absolute poverty with a single mother in Aberdeen, she was a knitter and then a washerwoman. And he became the wealthiest merchant in Orkney. So there's a whole chapter in my book on the Merchant Prince of Orkney. There's a garden street in the middle of Kirkwall. The hospital's a garden hospital. And um, he started off by having these traveling shops and then he ended up, um, uh, had this brainwave of, having traveling ships that would service all of the Shetland Islands and north of Scotland. So he, he became a, a billionaire in today's terms. Not that it was inherited by our family because the grandfather, <laughs> the grandfather had a falling out with that father. And um, here's, oh, there we go. So there's my, that's Robert Garden, senior. And that's my grandfather. So that's dad's father. And after his marriage to Rebecca, who came from the Isle of Man, she was a Salvation Army captain. And he joined just for a while <laughs> to court her, but I don't think he lasted very long. And after their marriage, Robert's father sent them over to, oopsie, Tongue, which was right at the top of Scotland. Um, built this beautiful house made of local granite. And there's the garden children. There's my father, the older brother, and the three sisters, May, Rose, and Violet Garden, quite common names in Scotland. Um, the marriage broke up and Rebecca actually ran away with those five children and the oldest boy died. So this was quite a traumatic time for my father. And Rebecca was going to the Scottish court to try and get alimony and um, alimony and maintenance and custody. And of course, she couldn't get it. So the father ended up um, sending them, the four of them off to boarding schools. And just before the breakout of World War I, she kidnapped the two youngest. So Violet and my brother, my um, father, and went over to the Isle of Man during the war. So here they are after Bertie had died. And Robert, his father, so my grandfather, introduced motor transport to the far north of Scotland. So they were actually quite well known and respected in Sutherland until the marriage broke up. And then Robert said uh, Rebecca had ruined his life and he decided to take the two Oldest, oldest girls as far away as possible from Rebecca. So they went over to the South Island of New Zealand. So the family split in two. I won't go into that. Why isn't it? That's just um, a, uh, what do you call those things? Uh, an illustrated address. Yes, yes, an illustrated address. That was in my, that's, that's a photo of it on my wall in Mullaney. And last year I thought, what's it doing sitting on my wall in Mullaney? So I packaged it up and it went over to a museum in North Scotland right near Tongue, so for everyone to enjoy. Here's Robert, 
Rebecca after they'd separated. It's a funny little photo. Here they are in Manchester. So, you know, they'd gone from being like one of the wealthiest people in Tongue, and here's Rebecca with the two children really struggling to uh, make ends meet in Manchester and decided to go out to Timaru, to New Zealand in 1921 to try and extract some more money out of Robert, who had bought this um, aerated waters factory in Timaru. So there's Oscar there, the father. Robert ended up dying in 1924, and I had been told that he had died of a heart attack. But when I got his death certificate, it said died of chronic alcoholism. For, <laughs> I think it was since the age of 15 or something. So there was alcoholism in the family and his brother also died of alcoholism. He was in Orkney. He had inherited the garden fortune and he also died at the age of 48. Luckily, my father didn't inherit, inherit that gene. <laughs> it would have been a terrible childhood if he had. So um, my father worked for his father for a while. They had a falling out and he ended up going rabbiting for a while, which was very lucrative in the South Island in the mid 1920s. Then he bought a bike shop and I had a photo of it and I have no idea what's happened to it. And then after the bike shop, he went and bought this garage in Christchurch, which all um, gave him the skills for when it came to having his own aeroplane and servicing them. So not only working with his father in um, the north of Scotland with his cars, um, having his own garages. In late 1927, he sailed across to Sydney and bought a garage in Double Bay. And he had two joy rides with Les Holden, a famous aviator, who also died, didn't he, around Byron Bay in 1933 or 34. So dad had two joy rides around Sydney Harbour and that gave him the idea of learning to fly. And this is in the newspapers. I mean, this is a fact because you can go back now. When I started this, there was no papers passed or the trove, treasure trove. You couldn't go online and access the old newspapers. If you go to the old newspapers in 1930, after Dad had made the flight, there were all these interviews with him as he was coming down from Alice Springs and Long Reach. And in a journalists were asking him, reporters were asking him what, you know, what made you want to learn to fly? And he said, I had these joy rides with Les Holden. But then all through his life, he, he cooked up this other story about how he was on the ship going to England and there was an architect who said, oh, with your background, why don't you learn to fly? And dad said, oh, I've never given it a thought before. So that was the real, I think I've got that in this article. That's the real challenge of historical research. I mean, even in this new book, just you have to, you know, sort of cross check and double check and dad got things wrong and exaggerated and made things up for some reason. And especially lied about the um, breakup of the marriage and a lot of those early newspapers that's got him coming over here, you know, in 1915 <laughs> with his, the whole family, he didn't want to mention that they'd separated. So he went back to England and um, <clears throat> bought a second-hand car, visited relatives, and then went to a flying school in Norwich. Is it Norwich? No, Norwich. 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 And after 12 hours dual instruction, got his A license. So he could learn to fly solo. Now, I'm quite sure this is wrong. I've, he, this first solo flight, 25, for some reason, my father hasn't included it in that. So he got the flight, he got the solo license on that date, the 25th. And why he hasn't included that five, which actually throws out all the hours from then on. And there were a few other errors in his logbooks I found when I was going through them, he missed out the last um, day in November or something on his flight over um, from England to Australia. Even then you don't know how, how accurate these are, do you? Because you signed off by the instructor. 
So commercial licenses needed um, 100 hours, five pound an hour. And my father thought, blow that. I think it'll be cheaper for me to buy a secondhand aeroplane and fly to Australia and I'll get my hours up that way. So he went into Selfridges department store and bought a little blue secondhand gypsy moth, which had already been in an accident. <laughs> And um, he called it Kia Ora, which originally in Maori means good luck. It doesn't mean hello. And short of funds by now, he drew his own maps, put a spare propeller on the side. Uh, put, no, I think the only other spares were two valves. And while he was in the library draw, hand drawing these maps, he noticed the overwater distance to Wyndham was a bit shorter than Darwin. So he, all the other aviators had landed at Darwin and he decided to go to Wyndham. Now he says he kept his, his uh, plan secret as he, he didn't want to be talked into going, but this is the day before he left and it looks like there's a few people there around the plane. So this is the day before he left. But indeed on the morning that he left, there was one person to see him off. And if you think of the thousands of people that would have been there with Kingsford Smith and Amy Johnson, so... He really was um, the mystery airman, they called him in the newspapers. And he took off with a packet of sandwiches on his lap and carpet slippers on his feet. Somebody sent me this photo. I've had amazing gifts from people from all over the world. People have sent me stuff and someone found this on eBay and auctioned it and gifted it to me. So that's a beautiful photo. Took shoes what was that? Oh, he took those shoes off. <laughs> Here's one of his logbooks again, going over Singapore. And here he is at Calcutta. So he was very lucky to survive that 18 day trip. There were several forced landings. He crashed in darkness in Jansi in India and he was hanging upside down in the, in the seat safety straps, listening to petrol dripping and this Indian ran towards him with a hurricane lamp. <laughs> so he, oh God. On two legs of, this, of his trip, he flew in tandem with Victor Bruce, who was, it's Mildred actually, Mildred Bruce, who was try, who ended up being the first woman to fly around the world solo. And she usually flew with a skirt and pearls around her neck. Uh, she would ship her plane across the ocean. So that's them at Calcutta. So he was the first to land at Wyndham and no one knew he was coming. So there were thousands that had greeted Amy Johnson in Darwin in May that year. And the people in Wyndham heard this noise overhead and thought, what the hell? And there was a pilot there from Western Australian Airways and he rushed out to the airport and there's dad standing on something, maintaining his plane. And he said, oh, have you got a cigarette? <laughs> so... And this was the newspaper report the next day, which is where he gets the name Sundown of the Skies. Oscar Garden, the casual flyer, flew into Wyndham yesterday after his last hop on the flight from England. Kingsford Smith has dubbed himself a vagabond of the air. Garden then is Sundown of the Skies. The airman took Wyndham by surprise. There was no definite news there that he would arrive. The landing ground at Three Mile held no welcoming crowds. So Sundowner describes, as you know, an Australian swagman who just sort of arrives unexpectedly out of nowhere and disappears the next morning. And that name was sort of used for Dad all through his life and different, because he did, he would sort of disappear and no one would know where he was after he left um, Teal flying. He was on the move all the time and it was quite hard to track him down. So he set off early the next morning to go to Alice Springs and the pilot tried to talk him out of it. He said, you know, you, you're absolutely mad. He said, well, Keith Anderson and Bobby Hitchhack had, Hitchhock, Hitch, Hitchcock had died that um, year before in the Tanami Desert, which was just um, north of the Sandy Desert. Tanami. Tanami. Tanami Desert. And... My father said in um, one interview, he was quite right too. It was an absolute nightmare. 
I mean, it was a suicide trip, really. I was damn lucky to get to Alice Springs. It was a long day, 12 hours and five minutes. One of the biggest jokes that shows what a novice I was and how lucky I was, or how green I was, I hadn't any water aboard. And this pilot leaving Wyndham said, you're mad anyway, but for God's sake, take some water. So he found half a dozen empty beer bottles and we filled them with water. I put them in the front cockpit in case I was forced down. Well, from then on, before I got anywhere near to Alice Springs, I was burnt to a cinder. There was hardly any visibility as I was flying through a real dust storm and I had to stick my head over the side to see anything. I was burnt and gasping for water and all my damn water was in the front cockpit. So pretty amazing. He was very lucky. <laughs> the next day he flew to Longreach and then he went to Sydney. There we go, there's some of the flights. That's amazing, isn't it? Like someone's there taking these photos. That map looked like life going by a broken hill. Yes, he did go through Broken Hill. Yeah, Alice Springs to Broken Hill. Did I say Longreach? Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. Long, they just bought some books. So. <laughs> yeah, Broken Hill. I've got Longreach here. No, Broken Hill. Now, one newspaper said 2,000 people were waiting for Dad, and another newspaper said 500, but I put 2,000 in my pocket. And another newspaper said 75,000 were waiting there for Amy Johnson. Uh, incredible. But he found... Here he is. So how many days did he take flying? So he ended up um, the fastest flight after Kingsford Smith and Bert Hinkler, who are veteran aviators. So he was the youngest to do the England to Australia and the most inexperienced with 40 flying hours. 22 days by then. Pretty remarkable when you dig into it. There he is. It's a long story about this girl that I dug up, but I won't go into that now. <laughs> the mystery girl from Papakura. He found the welcome absolutely overwhelming. He's got at this big reception, Fred Haig, who was the aviation manager of Vacuum Oil, who provided his fuel supplies on the whole route, had this quizzical look for here's me, holding a bun big bunch of flowers, looking like a sissy. I'm burnt to a cinder with a silly grin on my face. Fred was looking at me out of the corner of his eye, wondering what on earth he struck. I was like a kid, you see, a complete novice. When asked to say a few words, I was completely tongue-tied. So he was 27. He, he had just turned 27, so he was like 20, you know, he'd been 26 when he was learning to fly. So ha um, Oscar and Haig, oh, he, there's a photo that's now at the Motet Museum in Auckland, a beautiful scroll. There's Oscar there, I think, it looks like him. Here he is flying to Melbourne, I love that photo. And then they ship Haig and my father shipped the planes over to Wellington. And here's the procession after his arrival. He was treated like a real hero there. Even though he was born in Scotland, they sort of grabbed him as his own. And um, he did, the two of them did a big tour all around New Zealand. So the next one here, he is just going around Christchurch. There's a few grouped here. So there's, I think the next one. Oh, there he is with Haig. So the next one I think is at um, Dunedin, is it? Otago. Uh, this is a new photo in the book. I found a lot of photos when I was, um, knew we were doing a second edition. There was a whole group of photos in Turnbull Library under, wasn't even Oscar, and his surname was Gorgon or something, and none of us had seen them in <laughs> these beautiful photos under the wrong name. So there he is at Otago. This one's a lovely one. Here he is at Rotorua, the next one. And the next one's, that's a lovely one. Oh, no, okay, so stop there. So they did the tour of the both islands. 
and um, Haig uh, went back to, he went back to Australia. This is one little um, quote that Dad, or that said somewhere, this last week, he absolutely hated it, going around these towns and giving these talks. And he just was, he was quite a shy, retiring man. Well, he was at that time. This last week has been the first breather I've had since landing at Wyndham. This honour and glory business is a washout and I was not looking for it and that made it worse. I was absolutely sick of receptions and speech making before it finished because every town he went to had to get up and go to this reception and give talks. And so then he decided um, it was during the depression that he would make money giving joy rides and he joy rides. He was the first, uh, he wasn't the first, he said he was the first person to be fined for giving rides on a Sunday because Sunday trading was banned. And actually I found he was fined twice. <laughs> of, and, but he wasn't the first. I found there were two other pilots before my father. And so he was fined, but that didn't deter him. He kept giving rides on Sunday. And you can go down to the next one. Uh, someone bet him five pound that he couldn't land on Stewart Island. I actually met this man's son in Invercargill. And he was the first to land on Stewart Island and coming in to land on Horseshoe Bay, one of the wheels got caught in seaweed and it nosedived into the bay. Most of the men were out fishing. Next slide. So it was the women and the children that pulled the boat up onto the sand. And quite a historic day. I went over to Stewart Island on my research tour and um, went to the local hotel and wasn't aware of it. And I looked at the wall and there were all these photos of my father with the plane, different photos. And I managed to talk to one of those children that had been on the beach that day. They were given the day off school. And most of the children had never seen a plane before. They'd never even heard one. And they raced into the bushes to hide when they heard it coming over. And they had to be enticed out with lollies. So then uh, my father sold the plane and decided to go back to England to learn to fly properly. Because a lot of people on the, when he was giving joy rides, wanted him to do loop the loop and all these things. And he didn't, he said he didn't have the confidence to do that. So he went back, there was this new training school called Air Service Training School. Oh, before he went to the um, flying school, he just, his mother was back in the Isle of Man. So he went over to the Isle of Man, next photo. And here he is being congratulated. Like all these countries, when dad first arrived in Australia, he was an Australian, he was New Zealand, he was a Scottish, he was a Manxman, they all claimed him as their own. So he went to the Isle of Man. I'll go back one. Oh no, I actually don't have a photo of this. He went to the Air Service Training School to learn to use basic instruments such as the Reed and Segrist, is that right? Yeah. Turn indicators which was because all he had used um, coming over from England to Australia was a compass. That's all he had. So it was still very primitive. And he won their first competition for blind flying. And he was given this solid silver trophy um, of an Avro tutor with a hooded cockpit. And in 1973, he gave that to the Royal New Zealand Aero Club, which they compete annually as the Oscar Garden Trophy. Next photo. He met Kingsford Smith. So he did know Kingsford Smith. I won't go to go into it now, but he never talked about it. He didn't like Kingsford Smith, but he liked, who was the other pilot? Hume. Hume. He liked, for some reason he didn't like, probably because my father was quite, um, oh, stayed uptight, Scottish, and <laughs> Smith, he was sort of womanizing and who knows, but <clears throat> no, I never asked him those questions in the interviews. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, here, this is um, after Kingsford Smith's failed attempt, and he was very sick, and he'd just arrived at Heston Aerodrome. And this was two days before my father set off to South Africa, because he had met up with um, a famous parachutist called John Tr Trunham, Trunham, and they decided to put on the first flying circus in South Africa. And somehow they managed to get three Simon Spartans, three-seater, 
and they employed a few Simmons, Simmons, a few ex pilots, war pilots, and they flew over to South Africa. So we can keep going to the next one. Here we go. Yeah, so it began in November 1931 and they visited 64 towns. And it was started off like a, a great success and it was a financial disaster. And for my father's share, he got one of those planes and he re <coughs> renamed it Miss Mo Mobile Oil. So 1932. And he decided to have a crack at the South Africa England flying record, which he said was wide open. That wasn't a success either. He arranged for a special fairy metal propeller to be shipped out from England. He thought that would increase the speed by about 12 miles. He left on the 20th of April and he had a forced landing at Iringi with the engine, uh, yep, the engine crankshaft broke with the propeller sharing the bolts. And he had assumed the old bolts would suit the new propeller. So amazing photos. There's a whole lot of photos that an aviation historian gave me, sent out from South Africa. And he, he wrote this to his mother. So he, he, I'm on the way home by boat to England was flying home and broke the engine crankshaft right out in the blue in the middle of darkest Africa. <laughs> was missing nearly a week before I got to civilization. That's absolute rubbish. You know, he was, you know, his people here was in the Ringi, which was a small town. Had a pretty rotten time and I'm absolutely broke now. Have got the wings and the engine on board. So if I can borrow some more money from grandma in Orkney, Get them repaired. I'll take a boat back to East Africa and get it flying again. It just seems as if one darn thing after another goes wrong. So after the plane was repaired, he went back to his old caper of giving joy rides. I think he really did love doing that. Traveling up East Africa, Sudan, Egypt, until he reached, we'll go to the next slide, down. Oh yeah, there's two, look, see, look at that, incredible. Someone was there taking a photograph. That's what always amazes me. So he's flying up through, we can go to the next one. Fabulous photos. And then he arrived in Palestine and some of the Jews there thought it'd be fantastic if they set up their own flying school. And um, he had to apply to the British whatever offer. So they waited three months. And while he was waiting, he gave Dr. Mr. Dizengoff, the first mayor of Tel Aviv, his first um, ride in an aeroplane. What's that next one? Oh, you can't read this. There's flying is good for you. And here's some photos of him giving joy rides around Palestine that someone from Sydney sent me those photos. And um, he got news back that he couldn't set up the aero club because if the Jews wanted to learn to fly, then Arabs would have to fly. And he just threw his hands up and... Someone had been helping him with the joy rides and he wanted to um, increase his flying hours like my father had done and he was going to fly the plane back to England and that he crushed it somewhere. So that plane was written off too. So my father sailed back to England and this was the beginning of his career in commercial aviation. Now, in my last book, I've got this wrong. I had, he got a job with Highland Airways but when I put the logbook entries in, and you can actually track their registration numbers, I thought, oh no, he actually got a, a, a job with Scottish Motor Traction Charter and began giving rides in a DH, so it's not that one, DH83 Fox Moth. And he did say that he was sacked because of a forced landing. He insisted was not his fault. And I found this somewhere, I can't, somewhere on the internet, I found. It could have been from Trove. On 12th of August, 1934, he was at West, so he's now back in Scotland, his home area, St. Andrews giving pleasure rides. It was a Sunday afternoon and to avoid people standing on the beach, he kept nearer to the water than usual. The wheels of the plane touched the water and the plane 
tipped nose first into the soft sand and turned upside down. His two passengers escaped with minor cuts and bruises and said it was a thrilling experience. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he got a job with Highland Airways. So these two photos, but I can't see that he actually flew with them because when I looked at his log books, all it shows are four entries of practice landings at Inverness. So I have no idea why he left. That's my father, second on the left. And a few months later, luckily, um, he got a job with United Airways. So the next photo down which was in charge which is on the Isle of Man so he was in charge of the flying operations um, at the Hall Kane Manx Aerodrome and was flying de Havilland DH 89 repeat that's a, that's a repeat yeah, yeah repeat. repeat and Spartan cruisers mm -hmm. so in 1935 uh, United Airways merged with a number of other companies to form British Airways so we've got another photo there there he is and there's my father right at the end of the plane. And the next photo is just a publicity photo, 93 year old passenger. Now all through these years in England, he hated being in England. He had this hankering of actually coming to Australia and he was writing letters to his mother all the time and, try, and various other officials. And he heard the news that there may be this new company, Tasman Empire Airways, a link between um, Australia and New Zealand and I can't remember the name of the person who came over and interviewed them so he got um, it was it took years for it to be established uh, and he was moved over to Imperial Airways to learn to fly the flying boats and in April 1940 he delivered Awarua which was the second flying boat which meant that Teal could now set itself up and begin flying between Australia and New Zealand. So my father delivered that. It was the last um, uh, commercial flight over France because it was, a, you know, the war had broken out. 21, flight, 21 day flight stopped at Brisbane. There was a big write up in the paper in Brisbane about the flying boat. And he ended up at the helm of um, Tasman Airways. There was another chief pilot who went back to America and dad became chief pilot and operations manager. I won't spend too long on this. It's, um, here's this on his arrival, being greeted by his mother and his younger sister. And the next one is the flight crew. So he had seven years with Teal. Um, he was also the next one, I think is the, oh, you can't read it. One of their jobs was reconnaissance, is that the word? So yeah, looking, he had to go out looking for German raiders. That was a close shave. I won't have time to go into that now. He went out to look for the raider that bombed the Rangatani. There's a whole story there. Now, my father had got married in England. He didn't even tell his mother. It was a Swedish receptionist at one of the hotels in Stockholm. And they must have broken up. And she went back to Sweden to have the baby and then changed her mind and traveled it was quite a risky journey traveled over Europe and my father went over to pick them up in Wellington so that's my half sister Margareta who's married to some of you may know him Morris G one of the great writers in New Zealand he's considered legendary Morris G so that's my half sister and that's his mother uh, my father fought for years to get um, air hostesses I think they called them something else then and these were the first air hostesses that were stewardesses employed. And this next photo, I didn't realise it at the time because I've got another beautiful photo on the back of the book. That's the plane. That's the reason my father left Tasman Empire Airways. <laughs> Furious because um, the flying boats were never designed to go over such a big stretch of water and they had many frights and um, he, he felt they were being used as guinea pigs. And they had their, um, you know, hoping to get these land uh, DC-4 planes and all the pilots wanted them. And they were overridden and they got these new Sandringhams. And my father walked onto one of those Sandringhams, one of, I think it's this person here, Mark Morris McGreal, who dad employed, said, he said something unutterable, walked off and resigned on the spot. And the other reason he resigned, because he was considered boss, 
And some of those pilots I interviewed, I went over to Auckland to MOTAT and interviewed some of the pilots my father trained. And they said he's, he, they, he, they, had, they were in awe of my father. They said he was a loner, but he was the father of Air New Zealand. And they were all banking on getting this DC-4 planes. No, Air New Zealand. They said he was father of Air New Zealand because, because not, not that long ago, but they called him father of Air New Zealand. It shouldn't have been. The, next, the person who got dad's job, the, I mean, the manager, dad, there was also a new position of general manager, which my father didn't get. And I'm just trying to think of his name. And they called him father of Air New Zealand because by that time it was Air New Zealand, but the pilot said it was really your father. You'll have to read the book, that, that section on Teal to understand that. On VJ Day, uh, my father flew, this is going back a little bit, uh, flew, uh, there was Awarua and Aotearoa to Auckland to celebrate the end of the war. And late that night, he drove his engineer and girlfriend out to Carrington Mental Hospital where my mother was a nurse. And he was waiting in the car and this group of nurses who'd been out celebrating crossed in front. He looked at one who'd had long wavy hair and she had to shield her face from the bright light and thought, what a silly bugger. The next day, my father went out to the hospital and asked the hairdresser who this woman might be. And the hairdresser said, that must be Helen, my mother. And they arranged to meet at midnight during my mother's one hour break. Um, she said Bert and the hairdresser were sitting in the back and they were giggling and laughing their heads off while Oscar looked me over and said things such as good strong legs, <laughs> even pinched my arm to see how strong I was. I thought what a balmy, unusual, fascinating man. So dad left Teal in 1947, three years before I was born and um, turned his back on the world of aviation had nothing to do with any of his pilots, never went to any of the reunions, was very bitter. My mother said he, he didn't have a chip on his shoulder, he had a plank, and he really was quite resentful and took that out on us. He became a tomato grower. Um, here's a photo of me with dad, 1950. It was not a happy, no, the marriage with um, his first wife broke up, that only lasted a few years. And mum had to wait till the divorce came through and they married in 1948. Uh, it was not a happy marriage. My father was very cold, puritanical, authoritarian man. This is mum. It wasn't a dull life, but fraught with difficulties. He was so self-centred. He was miserly. It is sad looking back as he was a capable, clever man. He had a lump on his shoulder that coloured and soured everything else. I wanted to leave him early on and would have been happy to, but later on I could never have left him as he was a pathetic figure on his own. Maybe it was too much for him being a father and a breadwinner. Some people admired him, others were jealous. A few people in Tauranga, which is where I spent my childhood, said he grew tomatoes as he flew a plane, a born perfectionist. He was excellent at everything he did, at being a pilot, growing tomatoes, but not a father or husband. Um, there's uh, the glass houses on the right. And here's the next photo of my younger sister on the right. I'm in the middle, dad picking tomatoes. The next one. And he did go to one event when, oh, what was it? Um, 1978, I think it's the next one. It was a merger of National Airways with Air New Zealand in 1978. And there he is right in the middle. All those pilots in the front were um, So he's right in the middle, the first back up to the right, to the right, next one there, were pilots he trained. So that was the first function he ever went to. Now, I began working on my book when um, mum was still alive and she wanted it to be warts and all, as I said as did Richard Hitchens. Here's an email from Richard in 2005, April. Dear Mary, you've got the makings of a good book, especially the difficult bit, gives it a more human touch. 
That's missing from that published article. Now expand on the struggle of your mum to bring you up. It changes your story dramatically for the interests of those non-aviation buffs. Fits in well with the reason your interest was delayed. You're not harming the reputation of your father. You're just making a hero more human. How did your dad meet your mother? Such loyalty to. And it was that reason that the book was shortlisted for the New South Wales Premier History Award last year. They said it was no hagiography. Mary Garden eloquently evokes her father's brief moment of barnstorming celebrity. They miss out the teal there though, and all, but frames it between his troubled childhood in Scotland and her own troubled childhood during Oscar's long and resentful retirement in New Zealand. This cathartic family history is a profound exploration of intergenerational trauma and its effects on individuals, families, and their short memories, shared memories. And I realized one of the judges, I was actually following him on Twitter. So we ended up having this little conversation. And he said, when I read your book, I admired the way you went above and beyond the typical aviation biography and painted a rounded though difficult figure of your father. I've had to change something in here because towards the end of this book, I've got, you know, I'm talking about Jean Batten has all these memorials and um, places in New Zealand named after her, including, you know, primary schools, parks and bronze statue. And I'm sure my father resented the fact that he had not been recognised and that he'd been forgotten. There is nothing in New Zealand even today named after Oscar Garden. There's no park or streets, not even at Otomotai. There are no statues or panels or photographs of him at either Auckland Airport or Taronga Airport. I've had to change my book. <laughs> what happened is the daughter of one of mum's closest friends uh, is friendly with the family of a famous Maori artist called Graham, oh, Graham Hoti and gave him my book. And Graham had been commissioned to do this portrait at Taronga Airport and couldn't work out what he was going to do. And he read my book and he said, that's it. I'm going to do Oscar. And um, this was a month before I was flying over to Taronga because I wanted to launch my book there. They rushed this through this portrait and it was unveiled the day of my launch. They had Maoris there doing the blessing. It's not there now though, it's been moved. Next one down into the visitors area. And there's a little area there with my book on it, not this one, little information thing, which I did. So people sitting in the Taronga airport, um, you know. So Oscar really is no longer so forgotten anymore. Were any questions or have we run out of time? I was gonna say that it's a pretty amazing thing to go from uh, flying a uh, DH-89 to suddenly move up to uh, a short yeah, yeah. Yeah. four yeah. engines, and then five minutes after that, you're the chief pilot of the company. Oh, I hope two, you gave him a lot of training. Before three, years. three years. No, well, he 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 um, spent two years with Imperial Airways, mm -hmm. doing flying over the Horseshoe Route, mm -hmm. and then yeah. Okay. I'd have taken him as first officer in 1942. Yeah. Hi, Mary, Gordon Lasters here. No, no, he didn't actually. <laughs> he had a very strange high-pitched voice. He had this hankering to go back to Scotland like our whole child. It was a Scotland, 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 and they would go off to these Scottish little festivals in Tauranga. And when they had that merger, they actually gave my father and mother a free trip all around the world, first class. And Dad went back to Scotland and he, he couldn't stand it. He came back early and <laughs> went home and mum spent another month there. Well, Very those strange. Are, those of us who are not New Zealanders, where in New Zealand is Tauranga? Tauranga is south of Auckland, Bay of Plenty, beautiful place. So about two hours south on the um, East Coast. Beautiful Thank place. You. Which it, very similar to Tung where he grew up, which is interesting. You know, it was quite small when we were there now. Now it's grown enormously. No questions, please. Well, you had a question? Oh, you had the Scottish accent. Can you ask if we've got questions online? Who's there? Anyone online like to put any questions up? 
Yeah, can I ask Mary something? God and us are here. Go ahead. Mary? Yes. I hate to ask it, but as a librarian, what's your sister's book? <laughs> oh, forgotten. <laughs> I don't, I don't think you can get it anymore. It was self-published and she told me she wasn't going to write um, print anymore because there are thousands of mistakes in it. She just whipped it up in eight months. It's called Oscar Garden, A Tale of One Man's Love of Flying. And her name, well, we called her Anna. Her name is Anna Maria Garden. She changed her name. So it was self-published in New Zealand. I've got a copy you can borrow, but it's scribbled all the way through it because I've circled all the errors. No, Very I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can, I'll get one of our New Zealand people, see if they can pick up a copy. Just if we'd like to put everything in our library if we can. I know it might be wrong, but I'll note that on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can go through time. it and double check. There's an article coming out in, um, Oh, what's that New Zealand aviation uh, newspaper newsletter? It's called Tracking the Truth. And it talks about all the challenges I had doing my research and all the mistakes in my sister's book and some of the mistakes in, you know, some of the books written yeah, by yeah, aviation. Yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, if anyone wants a copy, they're quite welcome to when we go. To... Thanks again. Great book. Loved it. Sorry. Bye. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you Thank much. you for letting me come down. Yeah. Very impressive hearing all of those folks.